I think that's still an a, ongoing issue in Dota. I, that's what it looks like to me, but obviously I cannot know. And those guys aren't, they're not stupid players. They are experienced players. They've been around. Uh, they ha probably have very valid decisions for whatever they made. So it's hard to know. So I, th I can think of some examples right off the top of my head. I would say EG kicking, AY, um, Digital Chaos kicking, um, Moo for Moon Meander. Uh, that that one I know straight up, like because I think Blitz told me at one point, you know, it's just like they did they didn't necessarily understand like what, uh, what they were losing by trading out Mu and Moon Meander, even if they thought like on paper like this was for the best. Um, yeah, they they didn't necessarily recognize what they were going to be losing by doing that. Um, I think all of those situations are kind of the same in terms yeah. of this underlying value, like. What I've learned over playing this game for so long is that if you have a team that's winning, it means your team works on like some fundamental synergy level. Mm -hmm. And that is extremely hard to ever replicate if you lose any piece of it, like any piece. You, let's say even if you have five players who suddenly start winning and you have some coach and you don't even really value this coach, he's, but he's like some, maybe he's not even some Dota guy. He's just like some guy who puts everybody in a good mood or something. Um, a lot of times teams will change that coach to get someone who's like, oh, better coach. And suddenly that disrupts whatever flow or synergy they had as a team. Like it can be something not even as visible or obvious as, oh, you removed the captain, right? So all I've learned is when you get this group that actually clicks and starts winning and it feels good and it flows, that is really hard to replicate. And it's very rare you get it in the first place. Like that's the magic sauce of Dota that I at this point, if I were ever in a situation where that was the case, I would almost argue, always argue against breaking it up because just from my personal experience, it's it never improves. Like you can fix some of the issues you have, but then you're still just worse because you just don't have whatever special blend made it work. So, right, I think that's still a lesson people are learning in the game, and it, it's a very that's weird one because it's name. not very obvious and it's very objectively hard to understand and. It's not about certain players being better or certain players bringing more or less or different, like, I don't know. I mean, it's just certain teams click and some don't. And if you have a team that clicks, you should fight to keep that because the second you change one person, you're going to lose it. So from your perspective, I mean, we especially since we know that they had already been looking to replace, uh, it sounded like snaking. Is what Fauna said. They had already been looking to replace snaking with um, this other person that they're supposed to be getting. Um, but from your perspective, you think Tundra has had enough. Five like getting fourth remaining. in the regionals wasn't enough of a failure that you need to switch things up, right? I mean, yeah, there's no way. I, I doubt that was even the biggest factor. Yeah. Like there's no way they got this fourth and they're like, oh, now we. Aha, uh -huh, like suddenly we're your shit and now we need to change something. I highly doubt that's the case. Um, like, because honestly, who fucking cares, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Like, they shouldn't even give a shit. They're a top team in one of the most competitive regions. That's extremely good. You're going to go to lands. You're going to be able to get better. Like, that's what you should be focusing on. So getting fourth in some online regional four-man cup with it's like two series. I mean, the fuck cares, you know? If you have a good team, you have a good team. Remaining. They had a good team, so they are now going to have to rebuild a lot of that, and that's a scary task. Doesn't mean it can't work or it can't get better. It's just like, like sometimes you play with people and you have a team of players and they're really annoying and you feel like I can't play another day with this guy or I'm going to lose my fucking mind, and that can like be true. And then at the same time, you have to like make it work almost because. <laughs> It's, it's like a, a lot of people in Dota are double-edged swords. The, the fact they're so annoying or the fact they drive you insane is also what pushes certain elements to improve or get better. Yeah. Um, which is a weird way to think about it, but... I mean, Jack would always talk about, like, Wings Dota. Wings 1 TI. Like, in between matches at TI, they're, like, almost getting into fist fights. They want to kill each other. Yeah. It's like a classic Chinese thing of, like... These teams are always in fighting. They want to like murder each other, you know, destroy their lives. But like they win it. Yeah. I mean, if you want to win, 
you got to be able to put up with some bullshit. It's, a lot of times, these winning teams have a lot of bullshit, so. Yeah, yeah. It's not always the case, but. Ten seconds. Remaining. I think one of those rare examples of um, the, um, seconds remaining. the kick actually working out, maybe not long term, but it certainly worked out in the, the immediate short term was uh, Nygma, right? They, they kicked Matumba Man. Kuro said they felt like they, they needed a change of some kind. And, um, you know, they ended up getting second at TI. Who, like, who knows? Maybe with Matama Man, they would have gotten first again. But uh, with Weeha, they managed to get second. Um, you know, and it seemed like it did shake things up. And they, they were revitalized and they looked good again. Um, but, you know, then, then now Nygma is where they're at now. So kind of hard to say. Yeah. I mean, I, I tend to think that's another situation where, like, they just shouldn't kick him. Like, as hard as it is to me, like, you should almost drive the team to where people actually kill each other and you disband rather than Five kick someone because you feel like it's too much headache. Like, hmm. it's just what I personally feel at this point, but I've made the same mistakes. I've made the same decisions, so I'm not here lecturing anybody, you know? Yeah. And obviously it can work out. It's just none of those decisions are easy. I feel like I asked you this question before, but uh, do you mind sharing what what that decision was? What was your? I mean, well, for us, it was we kick snaking, right? I think right. the team that we were the best on was we got like we brought Rezo in on VGJ, and then we like won a minor, and we got se we got second at the major, and we went in that TI, and we got top eight at that TI, and I think we underperformed pretty hard, but. That team was good. Like we had natural synergy. We played well together, and snaking was a huge, like, factor point in terms of he was a very combative person in a lot of regards. He would push people. He'd push buttons. He was not the easiest person to get along with on certain days. Like he's a good person. I have nothing to get wrong with him, you know. But he's is a difficult teammate in on some areas, <laughs> at least yeah. back then. Um, and so we, I just felt like. If we played another season with him and the rest of us in a room, somebody was going to stab someone else, you know? <laughs> and so I yeah. thought, okay, let's bring in somebody else because, like, we're still a good team. But the truth was, like, there were certain things he balanced out that we didn't really understand. And we lost some of those and we never really got them back. Mm. Um, and so, I mean, we could have kept him and sucked dick anyway. Like, I don't know, right? Uh, sure, sure. Things are always hindsighty, but I think I at that point when I made that decision, I did not understand what I was losing in terms of like what this guy was intangibly doing for the team, even if we had problems with his personality or gameplay or whatever. Like he was yeah. still invaluable to the team Ten because of remaining. certain things he bounced, and so those are the certain things you don't. Five seconds it takes very experienced players in Dota to understand what those intangibles are and why they're important. Uh, like when Seb reacts to this Tundra kick, and he says it's one of the worst. I feel like I understand where he's coming from because that's how I see it. Because I think he understands like the things Fada is doing on that team, even if they're objectively bad, they're making the team work. If that makes sense. Right. So the team might be like, oh, this guy sucks and we don't like him and maybe he's causing internal conflict. Who the fuck knows? But sometimes like that can make the rest of you better and it makes your team good it's counterintuitive yeah. like sometimes you need a guy who's really bad so that your team is really good <laughs> which i'm not saying fought is bad i don't think he's bad at all i'm just it's like everybody always thinks the guy they kick is the problem or the bad guy in the team in yeah, some way yeah. otherwise they wouldn't kick him you know so it's like i think Liquid um, thought matumbo was bad in some way otherwise yeah, yeah. five seconds remaining I think um, a good example of that, um, uh, of like somebody actually uh, recognizing that sort of situation was, um, I remember Blitz would talk about he like how Liquid is and like how every person was important to the roster. Um, and I remember one thing that kind of stood out to me was like, uh, at least from my perspective, I think Koifa, um is probably like, I think he's a, a great player, but I don't think he's necessarily like on the same level as all the other people on the team uh from that last year's roster but one thing that uh blitz said is like koifa was like very important to the team because he was the hardest worker you know and like when when you get up and like this you you 
you go into the the boot camp area and this guy's already up he's done his workout and he's like grinding out dota games and he does you know like 10 hours of grinding you know like you, you can't like not you know work hard yourself you can't be sitting next to that guy and be like oh i'm gonna you know like take it easy today you know, like it's, it's yeah. super, you know, like the atmosphere that he puts forward to the rest of the team by working so hard is like a really critical part of liquid success last year. Yeah. I mean, these are Legacy things like no back. outside observer is going to see them and it's what makes a team function. Mm -hmm. Like at this point, I think there's a lot of players you can plug in teams and honestly their mechanics and understanding and stuff is like, it's not necessarily Legacy on par, Cruise but it's like good enough, you know? Pick. It's not like six years ago where there was clearly just a pool of players way better than anybody else. If you didn't get those, you were fucked. Like nowadays, most players can mechanically and lean and team fighting and stuff, they can compete at a decent level. Obviously, there's still a tier at the very top, you know? Like these Yatoro or Ame were just the two best carries of that tournament. I don't think anybody was close. Maybe you could argue, you know, uh, Five seconds fuck, uh, like Nisha was up there. He's like pseudo carry mid, but. Mm -hmm. Undying. Those two, to me, were just, like, understanding mechanically above. And there's always going to be that, like, very top. But for the majority of the pool, you can kind of plug and play, and people are generally pretty good. So it's like, what's going to actually make your team better than other people? And that's all the intangibles. Um, and how you evaluate that is kind of what makes your team individually Ten good. Because you're building that team and having people Quincy play in a way that suits how you view people should be valued. Right. It's like a kind of circular thing, but... Like Seb, I mean, chat's mentioning Seb. Seb is a very interesting player because I think he wouldn't really function as well as he does on OG on a lot of other teams, yeah. which is what makes him so good for OG. Like, he's a very particular off laner. A very, he plays very particular heroes. He does certain things a very unique way. He's a very dominant shot caller in a lot of aspects. Like, he's involved in a lot of stuff. If you just plug him on some other team, he's not just going to automatically you know carry that team to a, a world championship it's it's a very unique set of that like Undying. skills Undying. and intangibles that he brings to the table and if you aren't good at using those then like what does it do so all right we got a draft and i am super excited to talk about it. they've got a dawn breaker svg yep. is Ten is this hero remain. actually good because i play a lot of it uh and i i always feel like there are some parts i feel good but a lot of times i'm just kind of like eh, okay this hero's good i think this hero's underplayed okay. you have to have a very good understanding of this hero because she's extremely sensitive in my opinion her yep. ult is very hard to get value of and competitive and her presence is very like first 10 minutes dependent but she's not a very traditional support in terms of being able to make active moves uh like an earth spirit or a clockwork something like this you know um but she scales like an absolute beast she has an insane stat line her laning some of the strongest in the game this is where you want to make her shine um i really like the hero uh like i grinded it before ti we played it in scrims we just i couldn't get it to work but i still think the hero is very strong i think milan is a grinder hero so or like a grinder type player. So he really likes the hero. I think he can do well on it. I'm assuming it's going to be him playing it. And they got the Nyx ban. Nyx is like... Honestly, Nyx is just the most annoying for this hero. It's, yeah. It's just way too many interactions you have to think of. It's playable. It's not like the end of the world, but it's the most annoying. So And they have Ember and Weaver. So it's like... That Nyx ban is pretty important there. Yeah. Um... But it, it'll be interesting to see how they make it work. This Ember Weaver opener is also one we had discussed before TI in terms of like you get these bugs and slights going and it's just so much skirmish power. It starts to add up pretty hard. So it's like really powerful. Um, that Quincy has a lot of early laning and skirmish power going on. Like Viper, Dawn, Weaver. I mean, these are heroes. Don't get stuck in like random jungle fights for some, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. And TSM's more of like this standard Cruise, not death ball but like when they group up I mean now it's a little more death ball but like Wraith King Shaman like and yeah. when these heroes get together it's a pretty strong ball so these are kind of like the two directions the drafts are going I think Quincy 
kind of hard for them to just straight 5v5, to be honest. I don't know if they have enough, like, manpower to just cut through all of these auras and shaman wards and, you know, skeletons and all this stuff. But interesting, interesting last pick. Okay. I, I So one of the big concerns that I have with Dawnbreaker in this matchup is that I feel like they don't have quite enough... Like, if, if I struggle sometimes to be able to get off good ultimates that actually land in in my pub games, like, I have to imagine it's ten times harder in pro games. So, my biggest concern here was that they didn't have, like, the best disables to be able to keep people in a place, right? They've got Viper Strike. If they don't have a Blink mechanic, but Lycan and Queen of Pain, both are not going to worry about that. And then they've got Ember Spirit Chains. That's all they really had to ensure that Dawnbreaker actually lands her abilities. So, Naga, I feel like, does actually kind of cover that. Remaining. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, Five seconds I'm just kind of worried about, like, foresee a future where TSM goes on the Roche Pit at 15 to 20 minutes and drops the wards. Is Quincy contesting that? They can, like, poke it. Like, they can slide it and throw these bugs and, like, Viper walks up, but if TSM gets ahead, I think this game is, like, it's very hard to play, but that's just going to come down to lanes because I think Viper is a hero. Like in theory, he has a pretty good lane, and because Dawn Viper's strong ass fucking lane, and yeah. they're playing versus no dispel. Generally, Viper will win lanes over time if he's not versus any type of dispel or like illusion hero, or he doesn't get destroyed on the first wave, which I don't think Wraith King Bane's going to destroy him. So it, it could be a game where this Viper has a really good game, and then he's just a menace. And, like, kind of the same for this Naga. I think Naga looks like she has a free lane as well. Shaman Lycan pretty defensive. She has, like, another very strong lane support in Weaver. So, QC wants to get their side lanes ahead. Like, get this Viper so he can defend the mid-game and get this Naga a really good start so she can actually hit her timings. Because she has to... She has to be able to get strong enough, fast enough, that she can start shoving lanes in and delaying these pushes, right? Yeah. If she's too far behind and she doesn't have the map open up and she can't make TSM question whether they can just group up and push, then she's going to have a bad time. Prepare for battle. I think um, one of the strongest things about Dawnbreaker is um, her Aghanim Scepter, especially if the enemy team doesn't have any, uh, any heroes that like to build MKB or Bloodthorn. Oh, yeah. So, I, and this game is kind of interesting because I feel like um, Naga Siren's one of those heroes that, like, you know, it's one of those heroes where you want to go on, and if you don't quite do enough, oh, she songs, and, you know, she resets, and you feel really bad about that. And uh, I can see how Dawnbreaker Ultimate would be a great way to kind of ensure that Naga Siren always does get off that song, even when she gets ganked. Yeah, I mean, that's... That can be the strength of Dawn. Like, you don't have to use Zolt aggressively, you know? You can kind of just... Let the enemy go into you. And in yeah. fact, one of the interesting things in this game that we'll see is this Bane Dawnbreaker interaction is a very interesting one. Uh, it was one that I think was theorized a bit at TI. And I think there was a point where LGD even picked the four Dawn into Bane. Just because the grip range before Aether gets cancelled by Donald. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is really nice. So, like, it's kind of like Silencer Global, you know? Your dude gets gripped, you fucking Donald on the edge of the dude, and it. I mean, it heals him, and then it cancels the grip. So it's really annoying for Bane. And then you're also one of these heroes that you're pretty strong on lane, so you can actually fight a Bane, and he doesn't feel that great about it. Right. right. Um, so there's, like, some inter interesting interactions there. Um, maybe we'll see it. But, yeah, in general, like, Ags is the most broken item on this hero by far. You get to it. Like, for sure. But it's kind of dependent on being able to keep people in your ult. Which is yeah. not the easiest to do. I mean, Quincy does not have a lot of ways to keep them in the ult, so I wouldn't be surprised if he just goes more for some kind of like fighting build. Um, what is with TSM and their their obsession with with trialing? Well, is it their obsession or is it the enemy forcing them into it to some degree? Do you was, think that's the case? That, that I mean, they it was EG. It? EG was the one who was kind of trialing them yesterday, right? Sure, it's sure. like, oh, now you have to do it back. This is this is them try aggroing, which is interesting. Uh, Quincy read it, and they, they got the Naga versus the Lycan. I mean, 
I guess they they just really didn't want this uh this Naga Lycan matchup, but like doesn't seem that insane. I don't know. I'm not sure, honestly, why they aggro. I don't think this aggro is that good for them. Yeah, like, I, I mean, <laughs> watching Tomato take damage right now, it looks like he's going to die anyway. I, I could see a tri-lane, but why didn't they defensively tri-lane is, is my question. Because I feel like um, the way you talked about the draft, the Viper is the most important aspect of Quincy Crew's lineup. And yeah, I feel like it's of. easier to shut down a Viper in in a defensive tri lane, you know, where Viper's uh, like forward in the lane rather than this situation. Yeah, I mean, this tri lane is like, I think Viper's pretty happy in this type of scenario. Like, he's actually a fine hero to fight in these skirmish tri lane lanes. I mean, he's yeah. not super happy about like low levels, but he's Viper. Like, <laughs> he doesn't really care. Like, if he gets some kills, which is kind of what's happening, he's happy to fight and he's a ranged core. Ranged cores versus melee cores in tri lanes generally do better. Just because you have to commit deeper on them. You know, like, look at these TSM subs, like, trying to get on this Viper. It, it's annoying. They have to commit. Like, now they already commit in early sleep. This can go really bad for TSM here. Like, these types of goes. Because, like, they're just taking more damage to go on this Viper right now. Moon might even just be dead here. Yeah, he's going to have to try and get away from this Viper. The hammer clips him, slows him down just for a second. And that's going to be enough to secure a second kill. I, I think they knew the pull breaker. was happening, but it didn't really matter. Now, if anything, Auto's Toronto's going to die as well. Yeah, yeah I mean, this is a disaster. Triple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's what I was saying. Like, you have this melee core versus this. I mean, honestly, all three of their heroes are kind of melee heroes. Bane, Shaman are not, like, they're not real ranged heroes, you know? You have to yeah, get yeah. in really close. And they're just overextending on this Viper so far up the lane. And you're playing versus two chase down subs. Daunt and Weaver both have gap close spells. They both love to chase you down once they have your spells expended. They're going to out-trade you. Like, they have really good base stats, base damage. These are both 60 damage plus heroes. So, and if you're in a chase down scenario like that, you're going to get absolutely destroyed. And I'm not sure why. The only reason I can think that they wanted this trialing scenario is that they wanted to avoid this Wraith King safe lane versus viper off lane matchup like in the two on two yeah which i think is a pretty bad lane for raking i think he would have gotten owned but they kind of just put him in a, another scenario where he gets owned anyway so unfortunate it's a pretty big setback in this game um we'll see if they can recover from it yeah and it's not like their uh, other lanes are going incredibly well uh, Bryle does have the deny lead. I mean, it's a Queen of Pain matchup, so you're expecting him to be a bit ha ahead, but Quinn is not... Uh, he's not really falling behind by any stretch of the imagination. 16 and 4, he's just kind of doing... surviving through the lane, like you kind of have to do against Quam. Ooh, Tomato. Tomato's in trouble again. With the bugs on him, fortunately the stun on Apollo will probably be enough for uh, Tomato to live, unless the illusions find him, but... He actually gets stuck in the trees, so he's good, but they don't have any regen for him, so he might as well be dead. Yeah, he's not having a happy game. Uh, neither, neither is these two heroes top, who are also both dead again. You get the Weaver kill. Yeah, Pondo, I think, stretch forward a little bit too far for that one. Yeah. Uh, that's an okay. I mean, you'd rather not die there, but it's whatever. You can come back full and just bully them again with next set of bugs. Like, to yeah. I could even see Tomato dying here. Because uh, Yawar took an early net point, which I think is pretty nice. I think it's like... I always kind of would like my Nagas to take net, but I understand why they don't. Yeah. But Tomato should just die here, I think. XD. It's definitely a support thing, right? I'm like, ah, why doesn't my carry give, give me this ability that helps me kill things? Meanwhile, your carry is just like only farm. Yeah, I mean it's just rare that you have a lane where you can kill with Naga. I guess. Yeah. That's yeah, like why sure. ever take it, but I mean they're putting the pressure on here. They certainly are. They're trying to go for the second kill. You are going to be able to tank up some tower hits, but they won't be able to tank up the Brawl rotation. Well timed by him. Gets the Sonic Wave double kill. Unfortunately, not enough to save his side lanes. They're still unhappy about dying so much, but at least Bryle's off to a good start. Yeah, that's really nice for his game. Uh, it's not like the 
I think that trade still was okay for Quincy, but uh, it's like it's also not the end of the world because they have the unfavorable mid matchup, like slightly. So it's just pretty nice for Quinn because he gets the six minute power rune. It's not the best rune, but it's pretty nice for him. He gets basically to his level seven. Oh, this is nice. They're gonna go again. So you are TP's out. They say let's punish him. Now he's gonna have to do the walk of shame back to a lane. Really, really nice. Yeah, that, that's a nice way to like make it actually worth it, you know? Because now you're winning the Wraith King's lane. Before it was just this co-op benefited, but now Wraith King is really happy. Yeah. Uh, catapults him a huge amount, so... But there's still Saber problems light. for this Lycan. Oh, God. <laughs> He's still level 4. That sleep is not going to save him. The level 6 Kezu will certainly uh, find the last hit for that kill. This is a disaster when it comes to the side lanes. I mean, Brown can only recover one lane at a time, guys. Yep. I mean, he also just... He kind of got... He had TP up here after the, the tri lane was a disaster, so... <laughs> He kind of got forced into a very awkward situation where this Viper already had earned charges and Dawnbreaker was pretty high level with boots. And the thing about Dawnbreaker is you usually want to start with this Orb of Venom because it's just so good on this hero. But you need to get kills off of it in the early lane so you can get to boots because this hero otherwise won't really get there. And if you don't get there, it hinders you a lot. So the fact Milan got those early kills means he gets the boots and then it means these two other kills that happen on Lycan are a product of that. So yeah. it's really hard for Saberlight to play this lane because Dawnbreaker, this hero owns Lycan. He's like one of the best supports versus Lycan, which a lot of people don't know. Um, just because of how how strong his all-in potential is on you. So if you think of Lycan and these offlane heroes that buy Helm of Iron Will, generally they're good because you can't ship them. But Dawnbreaker doesn't ship you. She literally just kills you from full. <laughs> right. <laughs> she just runs you down, abuses your slow mess, Oof hits you with 70 damage. Starbreaker's use hammers you, you're dead. Like, you can't TP out because she holds her stun. So this is what's happening top, and Viper's another great hero to all in this. Like, they're just going to keep punishing his Lycan. He can't go up. And Milan's very happy to keep killing this guy because Dawnbreaker just wants kills. Yeah, one more wants. kill would be nice, but Saberlight, uh, he gets his level 6, so. But they can still force it out of him. And uh, they're going to try and do just that. Saberlight's going to go ahead and oblige because he's got the rotation coming in from Brile. So they're going to try and go for the kill on Milan. If anything, Kezu, yeah, maybe he could have tried to go for the deny, but I'm going to say he's got to be careful of getting run down himself. Turns around, throws the damage on a Saberlight, but now Moon Meander's here in the Sonic Wave. Pure damage gets the killing streak away from Kezu. Nice turnaround. Uh, Quinn didn't have TP, so there wasn't much turnaround potential. And they're just gonna like, basically, they killed Dubu mid and they're gonna get mid tower to the top. So, it's a decent trade for that. Again, a pretty high committal from Brile. It's nice for his game. He's like, basically rolling at this point. But, it's not that great for his Lycan. Like, Lycan likes what happened there, but he's still having a rough one. Yeah. And so, it's kind of like making the best of a unfortunate situation. Tomato. He's going to try and uh, hold this tower, at least go for the deny, and he does manage to get it. Nicely played. That's pretty big, honestly. He's like little things add up. A lot of gold you're just not going to get in this trade off, which means, you know, the next move TSM makes, they're that much little farther ahead than they should have been. Yeah. So it's pretty nice when you get that stuff. I think Brow's going for, um, he's going the Orchid build. Do you think he's going that build because he's so far ahead? Or Definitely he helps. Go it? No. Uh, I'm trying to, I mean, he could, he could just go the, like, Sage and Kaya build, I guess. Yeah. The one people are going. Which I think is okay this game. The Orchid's really nice for Ember. Because generally Ember's not going to go Yules in a game like this. He really needs this Maelstrom build to... Like, give them some more AoE presence, help them, again, combat the the summons ball type game right, plan. Right, Yeah, that's a good So he doesn't want to go Yules. Like, what, what is M Yules Ember going to do in this game versus they go in the pit with Lycan Shaman, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So I like the Orchid for that if you can get it at a good timing, which it looks like he will. It's also nice versus Weaver. Like, and the Dawn. It's nice for both the subs. Because honestly, Orchid and killing one of these subs is 
pretty decent value in the fights. Dyer's bottom tower is under attack. <laughs> Moon Meander acting as a courier, delivering one of the Oblivion stamps to uh, Brian, refilling the bottle. The full service here as they're going to try and take this bottom tower. No need for wards. Looks like the siege wagon and Brian's damage is good enough. Yeah, it's kind of. This map is weird. You rarely see both side lane tier ones go down before yeah. mid. It's kind of, And Yawr is just kind of like stuck down here. And they're smoking to him. Which I kind of like, but I don't know if it's going to hit. Tia, someone's to smoke. Yeah. Right, smoke on Quop, but, smoke. I mean, Co-op's just not killable at this point in the game. They don't have enough stuns, and she's... I mean, she took her strength talent. She's like 1,500 HP. So, when you just don't have stuns, Cyril's immortal. Yeah. What a weird number. 11 strength. Not 10. 11. I mean... 12 would be broken and I mean, 10 is just no one would take it so of course of course yeah. <laughs> they hit the perfect number you know <laughs> but I think this is a part of the game where Quincy they want to use like I'm pretty sure Kezu wants to fight and he wants to fight on this bottom tier one because they really want this tower to open up enemy jungle for Naga like Naga doesn't want to be stuck on her ancients only so Quincy's going to look to fight down here and this is a fight TSM can take. Like, Moon is kind of baiting it. And we'll see if they choose to take it, but they might just TP out. They're taking it. Throws down the wards. They've got TPs coming in. Moon's certainly dead, but Bryle is ready to jump back in, especially if Quinn can get low enough here. He keeps on thinking about that Sonic Wave. It's a pretty juicy one, but not one that would get a kill. And his supports are getting picked off. Tomato's quite low. they got to be able to jump in soon. You are. They try and go for the execution, but it's not quite enough. He gets off the song. They reset here. You are. He's actually going to drop pretty low to the Shadow Strike. What level is that? Only level two, so. Lost Rave King ult. Might go back in. Viper's oh, yeah, still they full. Are. They don't necessarily need the Naga Siren anymore. He already did his job. Now they can try and chase down Tomato. That's a freebie. <laughs> Bonlo even Man. pump faking the time lapse is a little bit of a taunt. Bottom tower is under what a attack. strange engagement. Radiant's I mean, we're talking about, like, is TSM going to take it? And they kind of, like, half took it, half didn't. And then the, the Wraith King just dies twice on the end. And that's also why Bots is just so good on this Viper hero. And Snare this hero. into the combo with Milan. That's, oh, very yeah, nice. that's, a, that's a very nice combination. Just level one of Ensnare is good enough to ensure a solo Guardian lands. Yeah, I mean, that's like super high value kill. As he uses ult, and I has to basically walk out of base. It's free gold for Naga. Like, anytime Naga gets random kills, it's super good for this hero. Um, but yeah, I mean, Quincy. Quincy enjoys this type of, uh, like, game flow where they get, get to play the map, they get the picks off, like, some of these uh, Dawn ults or Viper bots, these kind of things. Let's see if Yar gets picked here. He does get orchided. And they've got a Fiend's Grip. They could just get close enough. They finally do. And that's going to be a full disable. Certainly dead, but maybe uh, somebody's going to be left behind. Yeah, it's going to be Dubu. He gets off the sleep, and he goes for the TP out. Now the sun's used, but the damage comes in too fast. Ponlo with the uh, Medallion of Courage, and actually has a point booster on top of that, and another 750 gold. That's going to be a pretty fast axe for Ponlo. It really is. I guess that's what happens when you're eight and three, <laughs> like fifteen <laughs> yeah, minutes. Seriously, uh, they're going back on this viper. He's probably dead. The lichen coming in, just a bit of minus armor and a hellbear smash, clap rather, a thunder clap. I, mean, I guess this is why people ban co-op. This hero's just like, destroying this game. Yeah, it does I seem mean, to be the only silver lining for uh, TSM. Yeah, it kind of is. I mean, they're not far behind or anything, but it feels like he's the only hero kind of having good game flow. Yeah. And honestly, Quinn is... He's had a very comparable game. I mean, he's the same level as Quap. He's basically the same stat kill line, almost the same net worth. Uh, and Ember's... Ember's a very powerful hero if he gets snowballing like this. So... As good of a game as Bryle's had, I feel like Quinn has quietly kind of had a 
Radiance equally good tower game of its own. Um, tower has just fallen. hasn't been as flashy with like the two man co-op ults, you know? Yeah, yeah. Dyer's middle tower has fallen. I guess in some ways it's easier for uh, his stat line because it feels like his team is being very impactful. Whereas <laughs> for me, it looks kind of look like Bryle's just kind of like doing it all. Yeah, that's pulling true. Pulling in most of the weight by himself. But that, that should stop soon. They've got a Helm of the Overlord coming in soon for Saberlight. They're going to hit that big timing window. Tomato, who's about to get ganked, is about to finish up a Desolator. But he's deep here, but... I mean, this is a good angle for them. Like, they just find Dugo in the river. He's just dead. Quinn jumps on that one pretty easily. The rest of the heroes will TP out. They've, they've managed to... Quincy Cruz seems to have done a very good job of stopping TSM from uh, doing that snowball thing. But I have to assume there's still this big timing of the Helm of the Overlord that's going to be really dangerous, right? Yeah, I mean, they're going to get it in the next couple minutes here. They're liking ulti right now, so they want to try and kill Zember. Got He's the Orchid on him. Dead. Tomato's closing in on the other side with the stun. They're going to try and save him with the Dawn ult. It'll get the two-man stun. Followed up with that nice hammer strike is going to be okay, but they don't have the damage to cut through these heroes. Not with the Ember dead. And maybe this is where the uh, snowball starts a rolling. They get a nice two yep. kills straight into the Roshan pit. This is where we're discussing what happens when TSM groups up with their timing. This yeah. Roche is insta dead. They have Deso Wraith King. The the Helm of the Overlords coming out. This Orca timing was super fast. Shaman Wards help you convert on all these things. So, like TSM, I'd argue they're kind of behind on paper, but in actuality, these types of moves, if Quincy gets caught in them, it's where they can swing the momentum a lot. Um, Radiance Middle Tower is under attack. Something to note about. Uh, this Dawn hero is Milan is going this uh, lock at Ags build, which is good for his cores, but it doesn't make him like some individually scaling beast, right? Yeah. Um, and again, it's are they going to have the lockdown to key people in that ult? So we'll see if it pays off. He's pretty farmed. He, he kind of just stayed top this game, like farm this lane, which is a thing you can do with this hero. You just stay top by your tier two. They can't go on you because you're too tanky. And then if they go on anybody else, you have old. And you get really fat. So he's pretty far. But it's a question of... Is that net worth going to translate to anything in the fights? Yeah. That's always the, tro the trouble with this hero. It's like, can you make her net worth have impact? It's a lot harder than it sounds. I think we talked about this when we were doing the IXDL matches. But I, 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 if I remember correctly, we both kind of agreed as we're going to watch Milan get caught by a Fiend's Grip. Is that uh, I think we both like the Aghanim Scepter and then back into the Holy Locket rather than vice versa. Yeah, yes. I am I am not a fan of Locket on this hero. I think the only build you do it is this Locket Ags build. I'm still not even sure on that order, yeah. but I almost just rather have him go like some fighting items, but what, like Halbert or something? Is we're going to watch uh, jump on Ikezu here, but a sleep nice is going to ensure he gets a nice reset. Uh, Pondo's got to be a little bit careful. He's not staying close enough to the song, so he is going to get caught, left behind. Milan's now back in play. So is the Ember Spirit. But this, uh, this five man, it, it's kind of hard to force them to break apart. Quinn's damage just isn't there yet. And Kezu was like, I think he was flying out his BKB or something. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, this game is just Quincy kind of stalling until Yalvar's ready to join. He's going heart second. Which, I mean, it kind of makes sense because there's not a lot that's going to clear these high HP illusions. Um, I just wonder, like, how are they sticking on heroes, I guess? Cop's pretty mobile. She's going to have BKB. Lycan's just running around. Wraith King and Shaman both have blinks. Kind of hard for them to just stick on heroes and, like, kill them. They end up in a scenario where they stall the fight out. Like, Lycan ult goes down, and, you know, there's no co-op BKB, and they can chase them down. I think that's where Quincy will mop up the fight. But it's a question of can they sustain through that point. Maybe that's where the Dawnbreaker comes into play. 
What's so, your, uh, what, what would have been your preference, if not heart? Would you prefer an Ags build, or an early Scani, or what? Uh... I honestly think, like, Diffusal's pretty good this game. Uh, okay. I know it's some old-school tech, but... I feel like the Mana Burn's actually pretty decent in a lot of the... Like, Shaman hates Mana Burn. Yeah. Uh, Wraith King, it forced him maybe to... I mean, you're probably never gonna, like, Mana Burn out his ult, but... It's, like, a little annoying. The, the purge is decent because it gives him like nice an extra trap. slow. Oh, Kezu yeah. is immediately blown up. He didn't get a chance to get off his BKB. Nor will Panlo get a chance to get off any of his movement abilities. So those two are down. Quincy Crew just immediately splitting the, the rest of the map as much as possible. Alon's going to get ripped here. Oh, yeah, he is. Maybe he doesn't even have to use it. Yeah, pretty sure Tomato executes him pretty quick. I mean, these are just not fights Quincy can take. Like, they're way too far behind in terms of team impact. Just because the Viper's items, he has no actual team fight items. It's just... And he has no armor. So he cannot enter the fight versus this Deso Raid King plus Howl Wolves. And, like, there's a lot of minus armor reduction. He just gets three shot. And this Dawn is trying to get the Ags. Weaver's trying to get the Ags. Like, Naga has a heart. So, like I said, until Naga can actually join the fight and be the bulwark for their team, there's no way they should be taking engagements like that. And they probably feel pressure too, because you don't want to just let TSM walk down lanes for free, but that's kind of the nature of where they're at. It's also the nature of these AGS builds on supports. They're very slow. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've seen games where supports get stuck on point booster over AX for like 10 <laughs> minutes. Yeah. It happens a lot, and this is the downside of this item on subs is the, uh, the components don't really help you as much as they look like they do, and it takes a while to complete it. And until you complete it, it's a lot of missing gold. How long has it been Ogre Axe? What happened to Ogre Club? I don't know, I almost called it Ogre Club there, and then I read yeah. it. I'm like, ah, you ain't gonna catch me, you know. <laughs> I, I thought that I was know. one of the funnier jokes about, uh, cause like the joke would be that a, an ogre is so dumb that like he doesn't recognize it as an ax. He just clubs people with it, right? Self fuels, he's got a remnant up I'm sure. So he'll be okay. They popped the ultimate there from uh, the Lycan. So if they can just full on reset, this is pretty nice for Quincy crew. Yeah. And Yara is going for that ax, which is some extra lockdown. Which is what they need. And also the BKB lockdown, which is super good if, for example, he ever ensnares this BKB co-op. Right. Like, that's super nice. Oh. So that's that's kind of their big timing. And I don't think this game is, like, it's not that scary for QC at the moment. Like, it, they can't really fight, but it's not that easy for TSM to just walk down a lane. Yeah. Um... If they catch, like, the Ember or something, it, the map will close out pretty fast. Which is what they're trying to do here. Yeah, they actually... He tries to get Auto, aggressive. Though. Fortunately, there is going to be the counter from Milan. He still feels to be able to dodge the Sonic Wave. A huge dodge from Quinn. As they manage to get the kill on Moon Meander. There's the effect that you were talking about. Both, I mean, you talked about it for the, the Bane. But, obviously, that applies doubly so for uh, Shackles. Or oh, Shadow yeah. Shaman. Shaman, he's no better off. Man. <laughs> yeah. In some ways, he might even be worse, because I'm not even sure. I feel like Aetherland Shackle is never out of range. Yeah, Whereas I... the Aetherland's grip, you you get out of range of it. And we saw, we saw Dubu already has that, so... He's kind of like Gucci, he doesn't really care anymore, but... Yeah, this Shaman. Hard to just run up and shackle somebody. Another 700 gold for Yawar. He'll have his Aghanim Scepter. Looks like the Ags from Milan is now here. And he's got his level 15 for the cooldown talent, which I think is pretty important. So, some uh, some big timings there. Damn. Quinn's going to go the, the Shard. He's kind of queued up right now. That's interesting. Yeah, he likes it. Um, I, I th I've come to like it more. It's... It's more about, um, like, when when heroes die in the fights, you get extra charges, so you can just keep snowballing. Yeah. 
Um, the extra damage is kind of whatever. Just more like, it's basically extra remnants is how you think about it, and remnants on Ember are like kind of broken, you know? That's why Ags is so good, like the Ags Refresher build. So, this shard is, uh, it's decent in some games. You think you're going to snowball the fights. Three hundred gold for Ponlo and his eggs. I mean, that is a. There's going to be huge difference from the last time we saw these teams smash up against each other in team fights, where TSM was kind of, I think, walking away with it. Now with these save mechanisms, it could be a very different fight. Yeah, TSM has to be aware of these support eggs and what they're doing. Naga has hers as well. This Dawn eggs, like you can't just man up with Wraith King Lycan into this Dawn eggs. It's way too hard, I think. So you kind of have to kite and play around it. The Weaver one is, they have like really good single target burst. So it's possible they can just go on a guy before you get this Weaver Ags ult out. Because the spell is very low range. It's, it's not some crazy insta save type deal. But right. it's still annoying this game because they don't have a lot of backline jump. So like these Quincy subs can kind of let the fight develop and then come in. They can play very patient. It's good. That said... Kezu's trying to build up some armor here, but I'm still worried about this Viper who's Dyer's supposed to kind of be the front line with these Naga illusions. Dyer's like, he needs to watch his positioning because he will get absolutely destroyed. Like, <laughs> man will disappear in two seconds. <laughs> He's not careful. Yeah. Radiance middle tower is under attack. I, I like I like this idea of the, the synergy between the three different saves, though, right? Because, like, uh, mm -hmm. you, you said, like, the how the time lapse may not go off because people get bursted down. That happens so often. We do yeah. try and play Ags Weaver, but then you've got this Ags Dawnbreaker that's instant, instant 60% evasion, which, you know, maybe delays that death long enough for the Weaver to actually get there. And if that save actually happens, then boom, you've also got a song to be able to like reset things if they're like going on the Naga, for example. So yeah, exactly. I, I'm, I'm digging the synergy. I, I really like this from Quincy. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I kind of am digging it too more now, more now too. Like it seems kind of hard for TSM to go in in a way, right? Yeah. And the thing is, Quincy can kind of play with these saves, like they can hold them, because TSM has to commit in a way. Like, their team fight, while it's strong, it's also committal in terms of the Lycan ult is committal, the Shaman wards are committal. Um, like, if the Shaman jumps or the Bane grips somebody, these are committal spells in terms of they drop them, you have to fight. And Quincy kind of knows this, they're forcing the engagement. Like, they're saying, hey, commit to the fight to us, and we're always going to be able to turn it around. That's what they're kind of proposing here. Um, I mean, Naga sleep around the pit also pretty strong, so... And Dawnbreaker just ult. engages. They gotta get on the right heroes. The song goes off, though. They're gonna try and finish off this Roshan, but they won't have the song for the actual team fight. They should be able to pick up the Aegis Shard, no problem, but can they win the second part of the fight? Kezu almost gets half of his HP chunked away ult. by one hit, but the Dawn Ultimate is saving him until the Sonic Wave comes in, finish it off. He tries to get a swing of the hammer, but Dubu instantly stops him with the Fiend's Grip on the right-hand side. They're going Yuar right now, and he does not have the Aegis. They gave that over to Quinn, so he's gonna be dead left behind as is Milan who <laughs> god damn when Wraith King does hit with that crit it chunks people in this game oh very very bold fight to take I think uh, we're talking about like these saves and turnarounds are good if TSM commits but Quincy is the one who commits for the Roche right they use yeah. the Naga sleep and then they use this Donald kind of early on in the fight and then TSMs have to take that fight because then they drop the words commit the like and it's like, where are your saves now, you know? Yeah. And so Quincy does get this Aegis and Shard, which is pretty nice. They already lose the Aegis, though. I'm not sure if that's the kind of fight you want to try and take there, but I understand wanting to get that Aegis out of TSM's hands, which is a big win in terms of their lineup really wanted it more than Quincy did. Right. Well, See, the Yara result is they, they lose a tier three. Quincy crew. I mean, that's not the worst, right? Net worth's pretty even, just a tier three. If it was a land of racks, I'd feel pretty bad, I guess. Yeah, it's not it's not like the end of the world fight. I think overall it's probably neutral because they got the Aegis and Shard. Viper gets some extra net worth. Um, just the way that fight went, though, I think it felt kind of bad. <laughs> like... Uh, 
I mean, they're just getting hyper one-sided. aggressive all of a sudden. The Weaver's trying to follow this Ember Spirit in, but he gets executed before he could do anything. And now they've got the silence. The oh, evasion's God. not going to be able to save the Ember Spirit either. He might be able to come in and ensure at least the kill onto one of those supports. The Naga Siren Illusions clean that up. You are going to pop the song, go for the TP out. Tomato goes for the stun, though. He gets there in Ooh. time. That is a monster win. And now we're probably going to see an Elena Barracks. At least one, if not multiple. Yeah, yeah, you just run it down mid. <laughs> and no song, no Donald. Dominant wards are up. Might even get the Dawn here. Yep, they got him. Oh, <laughs> dropping his items while he's shackled up in that tongue. TSM FTX are going to go through mid. Take this lane and potentially top. It looks like they don't want to blow the Naga Siren buyback. They still have the tier two bottom lane, so this uh, they're not in fear of Megas just yet. This game is like this is a very conceptual type game. Kezu's getting slept here, probably just dead as well. But um, I think it's like TSM just committed with this shaman. Wraith King Lycan in the last three that I think it kind of caught Quincy a bit off guard in terms of how little ability they had to deal with the the group up. Like, uh, this Viper pick kind of backfired in, in some areas. Because it's a very precarious hero. It does not do well in these types of games where it's like he can't frontline because if he gets jumped, he just gets three shot by a bunch of minus armor. Mm -hmm. And so... Then it's a question of what is QC actually bringing to the fights, and just not enough damage coming out early on. Uh, this Naga was starting to do some stuff, but it's just like too. Ah, it's like every Naga game, you know. <laughs> it feels like it's always too little, too late. This hero just doesn't win in the current meta. I don't know what it is, but. Jumping after Moon Meander. This might be a clean pickoff. The rest of the team is coming in soon from FTX, so if they don't get out soon... Oh, Quinn! He let himself get hit by that stun. Fortunately, the evasion dodged a little bit of damage, so he still has a chance to get out. A slight run away with the remnants, but Milan's... He has no way out of that one. They actually pop the ultimate. They go for the song. They TP out, but they're not going to take the engagement. They would snare up Saberlight to try and keep him away, but Tomato immediately blinks on and kills Kezu. They are still in trouble on Quincy Crew. Once again, an ensnare. Exactly. Last time they had the Lotus Orb. That net might be enough for them to be able to get the kill on Tomato. They get him. He still has BKB. Still has BKB. Still has that second life. But Ember Spirit's going to... Yeah, they're teeping out. They're going to try and grab as many heroes as they possibly can. Any stuns? Nothing there. Dubu? I didn't think Dubu, of all people, would actually survive through that team fight. But a nice four staff got him up to the high ground. Oh no, the bugs are gonna spot him. Team's coming though. There you are. Shadow Shaman set up for this one. He's gonna bait out Dubu and then try and lay down the trap to be able to get the kill quickly onto Ponlo. They get him. Yes, Dubu dies, but they're gonna be able to get both the supports in return. Quinn is silent. He needs to be able to run out the Sonic Wave. That'll be enough to tick him down in Kezu. Well, he's got to pop BKB. He could try for a TP, but it's not looking so hot. That damage is too much from Tomato's Wraith King. Not enough gas in the tank in these fights. Yeah. I think this is a game where <laughs> you probably won't see Quap again. I feel like even if it wasn't like the game changer, I think Quincy probably feels like this hero was... It's like first pick, it's a first phase ban hero. They're like trying to kind of deal with it, and then it's still just like carried enough of the early game that TSM was able to hit their timing. Even though the side lanes were pretty disastrous for them. Like I feel like it's how they feel, but I think in actuality it was just like... Uh, TSM's draft, when it comes together, it's extremely strong timing. And I think it's... Quincy had to be really far ahead to deal with it. I guess they get one last fight here. I feel like they're just gonna get obliterated though. Song will actually save Quinn here. They want to be able to go for the back line. He actually positions himself for the Dawnbreaker ultimate. The BKBs are gonna go off though, so no stun lands. The four staff gets a Lycan out of that one. You are trying to commit for the Saber Light kill, but he just gets blown up by all this AoE damage. Quinn gets controlled by the supports of GG. Down goes Quincy Crew. TSM FTX. 
This is a good start for them, being able to get some revenge against Quincy Crew in what has been uh, a little bit of a rough history between these two. So, good start for them. Yeah, it's a pretty convincing game. Like, they came in. I like that they developed their draft into a pretty coherent strategy in the last three picks, right? Going for this, hey, like, they have very limited lockdown and very limited ability to 5v5 us at objectives. Shaman, Wraith King, like, and boom, bam, drive it down. Like, what are you going to do, you know? And it worked out. Like, the early game wasn't that clean for them. They kind of got punished, but that's the nature of heroes like Viper and Dawnbreaker is... They can destroy the first five to ten minutes, but it's a question of that's not just going to win you the game. What happens afterwards? And I felt like they just couldn't get anything going after that first early game. So I doubt we'll see those types of heroes in game two. I think Quincy will go towards more of like, all right, let's make sure we can just team fight them and not fall 